The Lord's Prayer is uh, probably one of the best known parts of Jesus' teaching. Even people who don't know the Bible or not Bible students probably uh, can it, it, to some degree quote it even if, if they're in a group just by remembering that they've said it before and so on. But in, in reciting the Lord's Prayer, you may notice <clears throat> that there is a line in that prayer that, that people will sometimes uh, use, use different words. And it's the line, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. But some will say, and there might be some of you, and I'm not wrong, I'm just going to talk about it a minute. Some will say, forgive us our trespasses. Forgiven our trespasses. And some will say, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven others their sins. The difference in the words is there are two observations that I want to make at the beginning of this. This lesson is really about forgiveness, but two observations I want to make about that particular line. One is uh, this, and that, uh, that we have this word debt that most of us in our prayers probably don't use unless we're reciting the Lord's Prayer. I'm guessing that you don't use the word debt unless you're reciting the Lord's Prayer. You don't pray, Lord, forgive me of my debts, because most of us would think if that was the case, we're really asking to cancel out our debt in the sense of financial debt and give us a really good credit score. That's not, uh, not what is meant by the term. Uh, those in the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition tend to use the word debt. Those in the Anglican, Episcopalian, Methodist, Roman Catholic tradition tend to use the word trespass. Those who were a part of more modern ecumenical movement churches in the latter part of the 20th century tend to use the word sin. So it could be that somebody simply uses a different word because of the Christian tradition they came out of. But which of the words is right? Well, <clears throat> we're going to do a very quick uh, little Greek thing here. You don't have to know this to go to heaven, so if you want to tune out, that's okay. Uh, most credible English translations uh, will use the word debt. In fact, I noted that even in national, which we would usually think of as a pretty, pretty uh, up-to-date, modern speech kind of thing, it uses the word debt. Um, the Greek word is ophelma. And it means debt. So when English versions translate this, in the New Testament, for example, every time the word, not every time, but most of the times the word is found, it has to do with financial or moral debt or obligation. So that is a fair and accurate rendering. rendering. Obviously, Jesus didn't have in mind financial obligation. He had in mind a moral kind of debt. But the, in Luke's account of the same prayer, he says that Jesus said, forgive us our sins, which is a totally different Greek word, harmatia, as we forgive those who are indebted to us. He used two different words. And then somebody says, well, where do we get the trespass part? Well, if you look at the very end of the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, the very verses that follow, you will see where Jesus said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So he's talking about forgiveness. So my point being that if you hear people use a different word, in a practical sense, it really doesn't make any difference. All three really belong. They're all associated somewhere in the Gospels with the idea of our being forgiven and our forgiving others. Now, that, that part I thought, even thought about skipping, but I thought, you know, People need to know things, so you might, that might come up sometime, and you'll know the reason. Sec thank you. Second thing is that this is the one line in the prayer that is confession. The beginning of the prayer praises God. We acknowledge His greatness. We talk about His kingdom coming. We say His will be done on earth as it in heaven. We acknowledge that He is the one who provides for us our daily bread. Uh, we close the prayer asking that He lead us not in temptation. But this is the one line where we say we are sinners. We make confession. 
And I don't want to miss that point because I think it is important to remember that as the idea of approaching God, a holy God, as sinful creatures, that we would not make confession, that we would not make confession, it seemed to be a terrible, terrible travesty. So with those two ideas apart, I want to ask the question, what did, was Jesus telling us when he said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, or trespasses or sins, whichever you prefer. Now these are going to be three deep theological points. The first one, Jesus is telling us that God does forgive us. Now you may say, well, we're here. Certainly we believe that. We know, we know God forgives us. How many people do you think are sitting in church today somewhere who are listening to that being said, but who are thinking, I just don't think God will forgive me. I just don't see how God will forgive me. Week before last, Deborah and I spent three days in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We were there for a funeral. The husband of her cousin, and really more like a sister, they grew up together and everything, her, this woman's husband had died. They asked me to speak at the funeral, and of course we would have gone anyway. But at the funeral, two of his grandchildren spoke, and they were brother and sister. And when the, when the young lady spoke, her name was Lexi, and when she spoke, she told about, both of them told about personal things. But when she spoke, she said she had visited him at the hospital just uh, not long before his death, and they had talked openly about Christianity and about faith and other kinds of things like that, and that he had wept openly because he could not believe that God would forgive him for what he had done in his life. He was a decorated Marine. He had served three tours of duty in Vietnam. And the reason that what had set his, his cancer, his illness in motion, was his exposure to Agent Orange, which was a chemical weapon used in that war. And here he was at this point in his life, more than 80 years of age, and he just could not believe that God would forgive him. So don't tell me that everyone running around the planet just knows that God's a God of love and God will forgive. That's not true. Everybody, you may feel strongly about that, but everybody doesn't know that. Now we know that God wants to forgive us even more than we want to be forgiven. And the scriptures are filled with, with statements and uh, to that extent. There, we can spend the rest of the day signing. I'm going to call your attention only three. In Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, God has separated our sins from us. Psalm 130, O Lord, if you kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. And in 1 John chapter 1, Confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The scriptures are just filled with that affirmation. Now my, my view, my, my sense is that we appreciate things most when we're desperate. So if you were just starving, most of us probably haven't had a, done a whole lot of starving, but if we were really, 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 really hungry, we would really, really appreciate food, even though we probably eat a lot of, uh, had a lot of other experience, times when we were eating and that, we weren't starving, but that time we would really appreciate. If you were really, really, really thirsty, then getting, getting a cup of water, that water would really mean a lot to you, even though our planet's covered with water. If you're really, really, really desperate, then you really appreciate forgiveness. The problem that many of us have is that we have gone to church so much, we've heard so much about God and His love and His forgiveness, that we may have lost touch with our desperation. The New Testament says, Paul writes about how that God rescues us he rescues us. You know how rescued people are? They interview them and rescued person, you know, talks about all, they thank everybody and they're just gushing and overflowing and they've got tears in their eyes and everything because they've been rescued. It's such, a, 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 such an ex, 
a great thing. And we read that story and it touches us. We realize. But, you know, we've all been rescued. Have we forgotten what it was like to be rescued? Have we forgotten the sense of desperation? My weakness is not in failing to ask God for forgiveness. My weakness is in taking it for granted. Now, I think that's why, I, I think what the desperation part, I think, demonstrate, is demonstrated in David's words after his, his sins of adultery and all of that mess he created. Where he says, blessed is the man who Expressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord doesn't count against him. That's the blessed man. We spend a lot of time in church. We maybe, I realize everybody hasn't grown up in church life, so I don't want to assume that. But a lot of us have. And almost since we can remember, we've been asking God to forgive us. We ask God to forgive us sometimes just like we'd ask somebody to pass the biscuits. It's just kind of one of those things you say. It's just, we just say it because we always say it. Forgive me, Lord. And we may not realize what we're doing. We are, we are touching the heartstrings of God. We're taking, we're taking things back to the garden, and we're, we're taking things back to Calvary, and we're taking things back to the tomb. We are renewing and reviving it once again, the whole reason why Jesus came. If somebody deeply, deeply wounded you, and then they came and, and, and asked you for forgiveness, I don't think you would consider that like an academic conversation. That wouldn't just be just an everyday conversation because your heart would be so engaged. Why would we think that God who gave his son would not feel his heart engaged every time we ask for forgiveness? As though somehow we don't recognize there's a cost here. Who paid the cost? All I'm trying to do is to say, is just to say that when Jesus gives this as a model prayer. And he includes this line, forgive us our debts. I don't think he meant for us to tack it on to the end of our prayer, just like we always do. This was our confession. This was our acknowledgement of what he has done. This was our engaging his heartstrings for the greatest price ever paid. But it does... It does, Jesus says, remind us that God does forgive us. Jesus is saying he forgives us. He wants us to go and ask for forgiveness. Second thing is that Jesus is telling us that we can forgive. Now, I really like the first part. I like the idea of God forgiving. I have a lot more trouble with the second part. A lot more trouble with my, my forgiving. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to dr create conditions. I'd like, well, okay, I can do that if they ask for forgiveness. Okay, I can do that if they demonstrate genuine repentance. I can do that as long as I don't have to associate with them. We want to create our own conditions for doing things that the Lord has asked us to do. We, Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Peter says, Lord, how about seven times? That sounds really good to me. Jesus says, 70 times seven. What Jesus is saying is, you can forgive the same person over and over and over and over again. People say, oh, no, not me. I can't. I, I can do everything, but I just, can't, I just can't forgive them. Well, you may 
not want to forgive them, but you can forgive them because Jesus said you can. Do you remember the recent trial they held in Dallas for the death of Botham John? I started, I actually started to show the video clip from the news. I actually have it in my pocket on a <laughs> zip drive, but I just decided not to do that. But both of Jean is, uh, is killed by a Dallas policewoman uh, who is found guilty of murder. But the most memorable part of the whole story is when his younger brother Brant is on the witness stand. And it's really where they have that family, uh, family part at the end after the sentencing has already been rendered, um, or in the process of sentence being rendered. And he's, he's, he says to her, Amber Geiger, who's across the room from him, he says, I forgive you. He says, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And then he turns and asks the judge uh, if he can hug her. He has to ask twice. And so the judge gives him permission. He gets down and gets about halfway across the room, and she comes running. You can hear her weeping. Throws her arms around him, and they have this long embrace. They finally part momentarily, and then they embrace again. Don't tell me you can't forgive. Now, it may be hard. It may, it may be the most, one of the most difficult things you've ever done, but you can forgive. We thrill to the story of Jacob and Esau and their reunion. And I'm telling you, Jacob had a lot of good reasons for not forgiving Esau. We're amazed by the, the spiritual maturity of Joseph, whose brother sold him into slavery. And yet years later, when they're reunited, he has no animosity. He seeks no revenge. He says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. How could somebody think that? I just got one brother. And I got a feeling how I'd feel about him if he had sold me into slavery. So, uh, Stephen is being, being, uh, being stoned. And as he's dying, he lifts his eyes heavenward and says, Lord, don't hold this against him. Paul writes to Timothy and says, talks about those who deserted him, but he says, don't hold this against him. And then there's Jesus. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You and I can forgive. Now I'm going to tell you, before I do, let me just say that, uh, that in a world where people demand their rights, everybody's got rights. And in a world where people will sue everybody for just about any reason, Christians ought to be a breath of fresh air. And churches, and you're a good example of one, churches ought to be places where people know in a, in a community know they can come and they'll be loved and they'll be accepted and they'll be forgiven. And that doesn't mean we pretend like they didn't sin or they ignore what's happening or any of that kind of stuff. It just means we love people. But my, my view and impression is that's not the way the world generally sees churches. Now, I know a lot of good Christian people who are that way as individuals. But as churches, I, don't, I can't think of many churches that I, where I've been that I thought we're known for that. We're known for a lot of other things, but not necessarily known for that. Yet isn't that being like Jesus? I am not a good forgiver. Now, I, I think I'm better than I used to be, but I, I wouldn't say that that's one of the areas in which I would say, Lord, I've got this one conquered. I, I, I have been hurt, which I'm sure you have, and sometimes I've had to wrestle a long time with it. Now, I don't have any kind of vengeful spirit in any way. I don't have any desire to go out and hurt anybody or do anything like that, but the idea of, of being able to bring them back in sometimes really hard for me.
But it's helped me over, over a lifetime, it's helped me to remember that forgiveness is not about their response to sin. It's about my response to sin. Forgiveness is not, not about their response to me. Forgiveness is about my response to God. Forgiveness isn't dependent upon whether they recognize wrong but whether I recognize right. Forgiveness is not tied to whether they really repent of sin. It's tied to my desire to love the sinner because God loved me. Now we make forgiveness all about ourselves and the other person, and I'm not saying that's not involved. But when it really comes down to it, forgiveness is all about you and God. Just like when he said, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors, turn the other cheek. I just have a hard time believing there's, I can be beaten and at the same time, you know, speak to the person who's beating me and say, I sure hope you have a good day. I don't think that's what the Lord had in mind. But in the same way that he asks us to do what is so against our nature, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love our enemies, etc. He asked us to forgive. And he said we can do it. Third thing. He says, he's telling us that our being forgiven is linked to our forgiving. Remember Jesus said, you know, that your giving is tied to your receiving. Your judging is tied to your, the way you judge others. The little book of James, it says you receive mercy according to mercy given. You've got all these things, you know, where we receive according to what we, we give. Now there's a story, I, I'm not going to read it because of time, but you, most of you probably already know it, in which Jesus tells a story about the master has um, a servant that owes him a lot of money. And the servant begs for forgiveness because the master is going to take his wife and his children and sell them in order to, to help pay this debt. So the servant begs for forgiveness and amazingly the master forgives the debt. Well, we'll call this servant number one. Servant number one goes out, finds a fellow servant, servant number two, who only owes him a little bit. And he says, you've got to pay me. And the servant number two says can't do it. And so the servant number one puts him, sends him off to jail because of his inability to pay. So when people hear about this, they tell the master, he calls in servant, he says, look, I was gracious and benevolent, uh, forgiving of your debt, and it was enormous. Now why didn't you show the same thing to your fellow servant? Because you didn't, then you're going to be cast into prison until you pay all that is due. Jesus' summation to that story was, even so, God will do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That sounds pretty serious. Sounds like what I receive is tied to what I give. The Pharisees are, I started to say a perfect example. They're hardly a, a perfect example of anything, but... The Pharisees had such a pious attitude toward people on the periphery. Sinners, the publicans, the prostitutes. And they had no room in their hearts, no display of grace. And the, re and the reason is because they had no sensitivity to God's grace in their own lives. So they had no grace to give. But there's a great lesson in that for us. The greater your sensitivity to God's grace in your own life, the greater your capacity to show grace to others. The greater your sensitivity to God's grace in your own life, the greater your capacity to show grace to others. Jesus says in this little line in a prayer that we just sort of rip off, 
We just all know it so well. We just say the words and everything. But this one line, this confession, should not be spoken loosely. Jesus is saying God does forgive. He does forgive. Just think about what it means that you can come to him and ask him for forgiveness. But who paid the price here? So don't take the asking for granted. And he's telling us that we can forgive others. Hard? Absolutely. Sometimes it just almost seems impossible. But he says we can And he reminds us that what we show to others has a bearing on what we receive. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to stand before God <laughs> with his cup of mercy as full as it can possibly be. And I don't want it to be low toward me because it, I demonstrated a lack of that for others. Because I need, I need his forgiveness. I need his mercy. But so do others. There are people right now that you know who need your grace, your kindness, your mercy. They don't need you to ignore what's wrong. They just need you to love them. They just need you to love them. Jesus, in his uh, closing days of his life, tells Three parables, the talents, the men, uh, and the virgins in Matthew 25. But the last one of those stories is this judgment scene. Judgment scene, sheep on the right, goats on the left. So he says to those on the right, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison, you visited me, and so on. They said, well, when did we see you, when did we see you and do that? He said, well, inasmuch as you did it unto one of these least of mine, you did it to me. Those on the other side, you know, when did we not visit you and clothe you and so forth? He says, inasmuch as you did it not unto the least of my brethren, you did it not unto me. We are never, never more like Jesus than we, when we are loving another person. That's as close to him as we get. Now, I've talked to, in fact, this whole... <coughs> Morning has been about God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness. We even had that song, So Will I. This is our moment to decide and say, So Will I. Do we have a song you're going to sing? Okay. If there's anything we can do to encourage you or help you or pray for you or with you, then we certainly invite you to come while we stand and sing.